this is the last this is the last of a three part series so thank you so much to the team for allowing me to come talk to you um today i'm going to focus on endodontic obturation and we'll talk or give an overview of restoration of the tooth as well afterwards but fundamentally why is the restoration so important for an endodontist i guess happiness is gp reaching the whole working length is so frustrating when you do the cleaning and shaping so well and then you take a master cone everything's all well and good and then you take the post off and it's short or it's long um so i'll talk you through an overview of why is obturation important as well as um technical hints and tips to help you in your clinical practice my endo journey uh i think quite a few of you have seen me many times before so I am fundamentally an endodontist who has a passion for teaching. That's why I am keen to talk to you today. Um, I'm also a lecturer at QMUL teaching postgrad um, master's students. Aims and objectives for today, fundamentally everything to do with obturation, why it matters, what it achieves, what materials are we using. Just give you an overview. I won't go into too much detail of every single type of material out there, but you should know your options. When should you obturate? Um, where to obturate to? And I wish I could do the practical with you, but maybe in the future. Hopefully, um, your teeth are smiling back at you after you've obturated. Why obturation matters? Well, going back to a paper that's quoted heavily in endodontics, NGSL, we know that four factors that influence the success of root canal treatment is absence of a periapical lesion, root canal obturations that are free of voids and are to within two millimeters of the radiographic apex, and then adult coronal restoration. With the current best available evidence, both the quality of the endodontic treatment and the coronal restoration are significant in any healing outcomes that we have. But you can see the importance of obturating well without voids and to within an appropriate length is very, very important to help get successful outcomes. How strong are your foundations? Why is the endo so important and why you want to be comfortable doing it is you want to make sure any coronal restoration that you place on the tooth, and if it's on posterior tooth, will be indirect restorations more commonly than not after root canal treatments. You want to make sure you feel comfortable putting that cuspal coverage restoration on top. Um, I'm not sure how that house is still standing, but that is a true picture. What obturation it achieves, okay. Um, we know, and studies have indicated that root canal systems cannot be completely cleaned and disinfected, okay. Obturation therefore minimizes, um, or obturation of the radicular space is necessary to minimize coronal leakage from the oral environment. It also reduces um, coronal leakage from the top and bacterial contamination, as well as seals the apex from periapical tissue fluids. And any remaining bacteria that you couldn't remove will entomb within the canal. But is obturation the most influential factor for success when it comes to root canal treatment? For me, we know that cleaning and shaping determines the, both the degree of disinfection and the ability to obturate the radicular space. So actually, obturation is only actually a reflection of the cleaning and shaping and is commonly evaluated on the basis of length of obturation, its taper, its density, level of obturation, and subsequent coronal seal, and us providing an adequate provisional or definitive restoration afterwards. It is not possible to assess the quality of the seal established during obturation with the radiograph alone. Okay. And it is important to recognize that there is no material technique that fully prevents leakage. Um, so I know as endodontists, we can't wait for that post op radiograph to show what we filled, but it's more what you take out rather than what you put in that will be a major determinant for your long term success. Timing of obturation, okay. Um, and ever standing argument in endodontics is always do you do single visit or multiple visit RCT? 
well, let's go back to the studies and systematic reviews. And they've fundamentally shown that there's no significant dis difference in the healing rates of ap apical periodontitis, whether you do single or multiple visits. Um, some have shown that patients experience less frequency of short-term post-op pain after single visit rather than multiple visit RCT. Um, so when do you decide? When do you decide do you do single visit or do you do multiple visit or you've cleaned and shaped the canal, but is it all right to fill it right now? I always, in every single presentation, like giving you one golden rule to take away. So if I put you to sleep um, for the remainder of this talk, just remember this. In general, obturation can be performed after cleaning and shaping when the root canal system is dry and the patient is not experiencing any, not experiencing any significant pain and or swelling. Fundamentally, I don't like filling a tooth that's causing a patient a lot of pain without reviewing the symptoms and them getting better. And obviously, if you can't dry it, you can't fill it, okay? Because you need to have the canals adequately dried prior to obturation. Sometimes there's also other factors that may determine whether it, what time you obturate, okay? For example, okay, difficult cases may require more time to carry out preparation. And if it's a highly challenging tooth, you may decide to break the appointment down into more manageable chunks. Um, patients may also require shorter appointments because of medical conditions, their psychological state and or mental fatigue. Sometimes if patients are getting tired or can't open wide enough for long enough, then it may be sometimes a better idea to abort for the day and bring them back in. Length of obturation. So this is what my, or my master's thesis was on working length determination. But we fundamentally know that instrumentation and obturation should not extend beyond the apical foramen. And when I was taught endodontics back in 2002 at dental school, um, apex locators weren't routinely used by everyone. So we were just told, aim for one millimeter short of the radiographic apex. And you'll be fine then um, because the principle was you didn't want to extend your preparation or your obturation beyond the apical foramen. But we now know that it's not necessary for the apical foramen or the apical constriction to be placed within one millimeter. And sometimes when you think you're at the apex, you may actually not be. So how should we determine where we should obturate? Well, you're going to obturate to where you've finished your preparation. So there's a number of things that you can use to help determine what, where to terminate your preparation. Use of an apex locator is a must, okay? And I'd always say to everyone, everyone says, well, my apex locator doesn't work. I wonder how many people don't read the instructions of how to use their apex locator because different apex locators can function in slightly different ways. And you need to know what your apex locator requires you to do to get the best and most predictable reading. Um, if ever I'm sure you'd also take appropriate radiographs throughout and use your clinical judgment to make the decision more logical. Okay. Um, the need to compact the GP and sealer against an apical dentine matrix is necessary because we want to prevent overextension of our obturation materials into periapical tissues. We know that we should root the links at or short of the radiographic apex are more successful than those that have extruded. So um, bear that in mind, okay? How do we determine where to finish our preparation and obturation? Well, your basic knowledge of apical anatomy where we know that there's a foramen, there's a constriction, that it's not necessary just not necessarily not sorry not necessarily just one point on one apical foramen it may also be an apical delta um realizing that there is commonly curvatures in the apical third of the root canal system is very very important okay also tactile sensation remember before introducing any rotary or reciprocating file into the root canal system you must get tactile feedback and create glide pass by hand for me my glide pass stops with a passive or loose 10 to working length before any rotary instrument gets introduced into the root canal system. Radiographic interpretation, 
become better at looking at your radiograph for longer. The number of times I see people just glancing over at their radiographs without actually appropriately assessing them, the radiograph gives you a lot of information, but you'll only get that information if you invest time in evaluating what it's telling you. Apex locators are fundamentally the key. For me, I've been using the Jenny motor, which has an integrated Apex locator whilst I'm preparing the canal, as well as my Murata Root ZX. And we know that most modern generation Apex locators or third gen, third generation and above Apex locators are very, very accurate. Um, and as such, learn how to use that Apex locator. Just don't throw it away. And suddenly your success rates will start um, becoming a lot more higher or maybe a little bit more predictable with the outcomes. Apical bleeding, remember when you're drying the canals with paper points, you are getting information then as well. Don't close your eyes, evaluate what those paper points are telling you and what information are they giving you, okay? I wouldn't recommend the last one, okay? If not anesthetize the patient's response, I don't think that's the best way to determine working length, but it's there for completeness because there are research papers um, on it. So I thought I'd mention it. Here's an observation carried out by my FD in 2018. Um, and my belief is that with further training, 80% of root canals can be carried out by general practitioners to a high standard with successful outcomes. It's just practice, practice, practice. The more you practice, the happier you'll get and the more predictable your results will become an endo is a journey it is not a straight line there's ups there's downs um and like i said certain days i feel like i'm great at endo and other days i feel like why am i doing this but it's enjoyable in the long term obturation materials just an overview i uh, if you guys want this one of the slides I will share them with you okay that's not a problem um but fundamentally okay um on regarding obturation okay the guidelines state root canal sealers are used in conjunction with a biologically acceptable semi-solid or solid obturating material to establish an adequate seal of the root canal system historically in the past some have used powerful maldehyde containing paste or uh powerful maldehyde derived um, formulations and they've been shown to be unsafe. So now fundamentally root canal obturation with powerful maldehyde containing materials is below the standard of care for endodontic treatment. Um, the traditional ones, powerful maldehyde containing uh, paste is like endomethazone, which we obviously don't use anymore. Um, there is now age plus age plus does not contain powerful maldehyde but its previous derivative ah26 did um which is no longer available on the market so just know your materials i always say if you know your materials you'll know how to use them if you don't study your materials in details enough you won't understand how they're working for you although there are many varieties of core materials fundamentally the most common method of Obturation will involve GP as a core material. And regardless of the obturating technique, remember, we go back to it. Emphasis should always be placed on the process of cleaning and shaping of the root canal system. The materials and techniques described do not routinely create an impervious seal of the root canal treatment. Like we said, all materials leak to some extent. We're just trying to minimize that leakage to the best of our ability and delay any reinfection of the root canal system. The choice of the obturation technique that we use depends on the unique circumstances which each case presents. So I can't just teach you guys cold lateral warm vertical or warm hydraulic condensation or use a carrier based system such as thermophil. Each root canal system presents its own story and the tooth will tell me what it needs rather than me using my same protocol on every single tooth. So it's better to have a knowledge of everything than just learn one thing. 
a little bit of a little bit of information on GP, obviously, as it's very very important. Okay, it's a trans isomer of rubber, which is a trans polyisoprene. Okay, it's produ produced from maize wood trees, and in its naturally occurring form of form, it's in its alpha phase, but most are manufactured in its beta phase, and when heated, they can shift between phases. Okay. Um, also, many people think GP is just GP, but only 19 to 20% of GP points are actually GP and 59 to 75% of it is commonly zinc oxide. Then there's also some barium sulfate um, to make it radio opaque with some waxes and resins as well. So know what you're using and why, okay? The benefits of GP is dimensionally stable. It can be softened by heat or organic solvents. It's compactable and adapts to irregularities to a certain extent. Um, it's radiopaque, non-allergenic, easily removed, <clears throat> and there's no discoloration of two structure. So overall, it has its advantages. Disadvantages, we know it's cytotoxic in cell culture. Large particles may get encapsulated, but small ones can provoke an intense foreign body reaction. Hence why we want to stay short or at working length rather than going through. Other disadvantages, there's no adhesive qualities, it lacks rigidity, can be displaced by pressure, and it has no bacteriostatic properties as such. It's just showing how material can be displaced if you've not gauged things properly. And hopefully, if I ever do have the privilege of teaching a few of you posting cores um, in FD training. I won't teach you how to place posts like that. Sealers are used in conjunction with the core material. There is a vast majority of sealers out there. I'm not going to bore you to death by reading all of this, but fundamentally, it will seal the spaces between the obturating material or obturating core material and the dentinal walls of the root canal. It will fill the space between the accessory curtains and your master cone when using a cold lateral condensation technique may be able to fill canal regularities such as lateral canals and deltas um, within the root canal system. May make it easier to place the cones themselves, may be able to deliver some antibacterial properties and obviously entomb any residual bacteria. Ideal properties of the sealers, I'm not going to, again, bore you reading all of those, but some of them are just common sense things, uh, common sense things, okay? So you obviously want it to create the best seal possible and all the stipulated points ahead. You will get the slides if you want. I don't want to keep you here till 9.30 tonight. Types of sealers. There's loads, okay? There's zinc oxide-based sealers, calcium hydroxide-based sealers, GIC-based sealers, silicon-based sealers, resin-based sealers, and calcium silicate-based sealers. Um, my advice to you is know what you use and why, okay? And what, it, what are its properties, okay? Because if you don't know what you're using, then you don't know how it's gonna predictably seal the root canal system. Zinc oxide-based sealers uh, are like your tubercil, okay? They have some antibacterial properties, but are toxic in contact with vital tissues, okay? Um, and historically, some contend it's powerful maldehyde. Examples are there, okay? We also know that zinc oxide usual materials will resorb if extruded into the periapical tissues, but the downside is they slightly shrink on setting and are soluble. Then you have the calcium hydroxide based sealers such as a Pixit and Seolopex, which due to the calcium hydroxide effect have been shown to potentially have a therapeutic effect. However, have, they've been shown to have a lack of sturdiness and a tendency to leak. GIC based sealers, I don't use any of these, but there, there is possibly some adhesion to dentine. I don't know if enough. Um, silicon-based sealers such as gut, gut flow and rheocosil, you can inject the sealer 
more and more now as well with biceramic sealers, and it may be the way of the future, you can inject biceramic sealers into the root canal system and then use a GP cone to spread the sealer into the canal irregularities and allow it to flow within the root canal system and seal everything off. Um, and the benefit of uh, biceramic sealers is obviously they are very, very, very biocompatible. So even if you get some extrusion, it's not the end of the world. Chances are, if you thoroughly cleaned and disinfected the root canal system, things will heal up nicely. What I use, I have used, and I'm most probably now transitioning to biceramic sealers, but I'd say up to about a year ago, AH Plus was my go-to fundamentally because it's been shown to have the greatest stability in solution. So it doesn't, it hasn't got high tissue solubility. What you obturate like on day one, it will look like the same in three, four, five years. You won't dissolve away. Whereas something like Tubacil, it is tissue, its solubility has got poor solubility. So sometimes you obturate and your post-op rad looks great. And then three, four years later, you take a repeat rad and it see, looks like your endo is short. That's because the seal is dissolved over time. Um, also, it had the highest film thickness. Okay. And commonly, um, lots and lots of people use it as their um, sealer of choice. For me now, I moved on to bioceramic sealers. I use to total fill bioceramic sealer, um, high flow. The reason why high flow is the only bioceramic sealer that can be used with cold um, condensation and warm condensation. Um, and the high flow variety can be used for both cold and warm condensation. So I can use it for all my cases. The other examples of it are the IRU, MTA Philippex, Viru RCS, um, two saver do a really good one, one fill. They're all great, great materials, okay? Um, why are these becoming more commonly used? It's because they have excellent sealing properties and are extremely biocompatible. Um, in principle, any sealer based on calcium silicate should prove to be successful. They also have been shown to be extremely biocompatible compatible even if they're extruded into periridicular tissues. I never ever aim for sealer puffs. That, that is not my purpose. I concentrate on what I am taking out, my cleaning and shaping. So I'm not sitting there at the end of my day going, hope I get a puff, hope I get a puff. No, that's not what we're trying to do. We think biologically, try and think about what you're trying to achieve, which is the eradication of bacteria. If I get a puff, it may show me how effective my cleaning or shaping wasn't, or it may just be the anatomy of the root canal system dictates what my obturation looks like. So don't go looking for puffs. If it happens, it's fine. If it doesn't, just concentrate on your cleaning and shaping effectively to working length without any procedural errors as best we can. GP filling techniques. I'll give you an overview again, but there are numerous, okay? Cold lateral condensation. I do not now routinely use this as my go-to technique. I know many FDs and at university, you might be told cold, taught cold lateral condensation. It's still considered the gold standard, okay? You prepare the canal to a decided taper and you subsequently will obturate that with a master cone and subsequent accessory points, okay? Historically, when we were allowed to use chloroform, so I'm not gonna go into detail about the chloroform dip, dip technique, but what the chloroform dip, dip technique was, is you could modify the shape of the apical region of your master cone to take the shape of the actual canal itself, because you would just dip the tip of your master cone in chloroform, insert it into the root canal system, take it out, and it would, soften the GP enough to take the shape of the apex. We know no longer can do that. My one advice, if you're doing cold lateral, is make sure you're using the same accessory points as the finger spreader that you're using. So if you're using a size A finger spreader, use size A accessory cones 
the number of times people don't, I know it sounds like a silly thing to say, but they don't double check they're using the right things all the time. And also, once you put your master code in place, try and, or sorry, you place your master code in place, try and get your finger spread as close to working length as you can. And I'd always put a stopper on my finger spreader. Why would I put a stopper on my finger spreader? So that at all times I know where I am within that root canal system with that finger spreader. Right, guys, that's important. So you know how well you're obturating or where is the resistance. And you want to ideally get the finger spreader to within one millimeter of the working length. And sometimes we're too quick to take the finger spreader out. Leave the finger spreader in there for about 10 seconds. And then when you're actually putting the finger spreader in, be mindful of which direction it's going in and also mindful of where you're applying the pressure because you're then going to subsequently be putting a um, accessory cone in there. So I use it as a trial run and I'm actually mindful of what direction is the canal going in, what direction am I going to put my accessory cone in and to what length am I going to go in. And if it's measured, you're more likely not to have voids. Whereas if you just put shove a finger spreader in, hope for the best and try and take it down as far as you can and then put an accessory cone, what if that accessory cone buckles? Or what if you haven't fully seated it? Whereas if you measure things, you're more likely to predictably seal things off a little bit better. ISO standardized GP points, okay, are an O2 taper. You can get non-standardized GP points which are matched to your finger spreaders. And you can also get 04, 06 taper, GP points, whatever you use, just make sure it's matching to what you have. You can achieve some excellent results with collateral condensation, okay? It doesn't mean you're using collateral, you can't achieve great results. To this day, it's still the most widely used technique and it's still the gold standard for any comparison. So any new obturating techniques that come to the market will always be compared against cold lateral, okay? Your obturation will only be as good as your preparation. So the quality of your obturation will always be dictated by the quality of your preparation, okay? Its downsides are you're unable to create a homogeneous mass of GP. Obviously, you've got lots of sealer. Um, in between your GP master cone and your accessory points. And you might also cause entrapment of undesirable pools of sealer. You might not also be able to fill any accessory anatomy, but how important is that to outcomes? Okay. Um, remember, concentrate on what you're taking out or fully adapt to any canal irregularities that are there. Be careful though, okay. Root fractures have been associated with forces applied during cold lateral condensation. Um, there's no gauge or measurement to it. You'll learn by feel, okay? Um, but just be mindful of how you're inserting things and what you're doing, okay? That's just to show you anatomy isn't relatively just straightforward and what you think it is. There are accessory anatomy, deltas, fins, grooves, communications, that we want to try and seal as best we possibly can. Warm or hot obturation techniques, okay. Um, we can talk about warm techniques that have been used to improve collateral condensation, okay, by the use of heated pluggers, touch and heat systems, ultrasonically activated spreaders, okay. Um, some will use thermomechanical compaction, okay. Um, Fundamentally, okay, um, you introduce a single cone of GP into the canal. You put a gutter condenser or compactor into the canal. The GP then becomes plasticized by the heat and friction and pushed to the apex. And then the thermocompactor is pushed coronally, and coronally by back pressure. So fundamentally, you put the GP cone in, you put this compactor in, it will by friction and heat, melt the GP, push it to the sides. And then whilst it's doing that, that instrument will back out and then you subsequently put a GP cone right in the middle. Um, and it's meant to help 
possibly feel the canals a little bit better. Do I do this? No, because its drawbacks are fragility and fracture of instruments. And also it's not possible to control your apical seal and you may get some extrusion or filling material. Um, this is densized gutter condenser. I personally have never done this, but I didn't want to eliminate it because some of you in the future might come across this in your FD practices and it is a valid method of obturation. Why do people do it? Okay. Um, less or tag a hybrid technique, as it's known, less apical leakage when thermal compaction is used after collateral condensation um, when compared with, uh, sorry, less apical leakage when thermal compaction is used after collateral condensation of the apical portion than pure thermal compaction by itself. So you'd fundamentally do cold lateral. So a modification could be, or the tag hybrid technique is you do cold lateral, sear everything off, and then do the thermal compaction. The technique is written here for you. And if practically we were gonna do this, this is a process that you'd follow. Again, too much detail for what you need to know for here and now, but it's a good to know about it if you come across it, which you may do in the near future. Thermoplasticized or heated GP, okay, um, is what most specialists are using now, or warm hydraulic condensation or continuous wave of condensation. Um, why? You're heating up the GP, you're adapting it to the shape of the root canals, possibly a little bit better, okay. Its downsides though are it can be very time consuming, but it gets quicker with more experience. You're also though, however, introducing pluggers or um, heated instruments into the root canal system. And these pluggers, you're applying force to try and make sure that the GP adequately adapts to the root canal system. And because you're putting force on these pluggers, it's possible to cause root fractures. So I've never done it, but I'm sure you might, if you're too forceful, get some micro cracks within the root canal system that you wouldn't see and may lead to failure further down the line. Possible damage to the cells of the periodontal ligament. You've got to be mindful that that tip will get really, really hot when you're heating it. So you only want to activate it for as long as necessary, not just leave or keep your fit and finger on the trigger for as long as possible. Advantages of warm vertical condensation or continuous wave of condensation. It's its fast and effective apical seal. You're creating an apical plug of five millimeters. Okay. And then subsequently, after you've, contra you've created that apical plug, you backfill the rest of the canal with heated GP. Um, you have a controlled zonal filling of your root canal system. And especially useful is when you're doing a post preparation, there's no need to remove any excess GP. It's already done. It's widely based on Shilder's original technique specialist recommendation currently i'd say yes i think in the future we might be moving to bioceramic sealers um either cold condensation just bioceramic sealer with single cones or warm hydraulic condensation where we still use the pluggers that are heated up to melt the gp but we don't have to use them with force and carry them deep within the root canal system we'll just get rid of the coronal portion and then backfill those. And that's what I'm more and more moving towards because I just don't like the idea of introducing pluggers deep within root canal systems when I don't know whether I'm creating cracks or not. Disadvantage is obviously expense. You've got to buy lots and lots of equipment. Um, wider taper and preparations are necessary to go deep within the root canal system. Curved canals, you won't be able to get within five millimeters of the radiographic apex. You will just heat down or do your down pack to as far as um, the canal will allow. Root surface temperature rises at tips. The tip can get heated up to 200 degrees. Okay. And obviously, there is a need to backfill the canal with heated GP. Again, 
This is just a couple of simple cases showing warm vertical condensation where you're able to fill apical anatomy fairly nicely and get some decent healing results. Um, in this case, I've seen this patient again. Subsequently, the five has been taken out because um, it had a VRF vertical root fracture of which that J-shaped lesion is fairly characteristic. This was actually a referral case um, because the referring dentist started to go a little bit askew with the access cavity preparation on the four and patient didn't know anything was going on with the six until I spoke to him. With warm vertical or continuous wave of condensation, um, you can use non-standardized GP points and most of your rotary systems will come with matching GP points. My advice, just use them, okay? Um, but it's not necessary that the GP points match or fit as accurately as you think because manufacturers are allowed to produce the GP points with a 5% or 5% 5, 5 of leniency with regards to their measurements. So if the first GP point doesn't fit, accurately try another one first. If two, three, four aren't fitting, don't kid yourself, you may have just blocked the canal with a little bit of dentinal debris and you may have to irrigate and redry. Most frustrating thing in the world, but it's worth it in the end when you get a better result, okay? So endo is not about shortcuts, it's about eliminating errors in process. Common machines used for the um, downpack system being its versions and the pluggers that I was talking to you about come in 04, 06, 08, 10, 12, taper, and obviously the larger canals you use the larger tapers, smaller and finer canals you use the finer tapers. Downpack technique, again, I will not bore you to death. If I ever get the opportunity to teach you it practically, it'd be great. Um, fairly fun to do, okay? But it's to do with using the system B. And then in the end, you will just inject thermoplasticized GP to the point where you have done your down pack. And these are literally like guns that contain heated GP and you just press the trigger and it will inject out GP. Um, some, and if some of you follow Stalo Italiano, won't do um, any apical plug and they call it the squirt technique where they'll just use thermoplasticized GP into the root canal system um, where they're just squirting heated GP and then packing it. The only problem is you have poor length control there, okay? Um, and it can sometimes cause issues, okay? And also, it's benefits of using the backfill, okay? It's more of a homogenous obturation, minimal need for sealer, okay? Um, however, there is a lack of control when it comes to using heated GP. So the benefit of creating an apical plug is always there. Um, Remember, GP contracts, okay, on cooling. So you have to bear that in mind and be very efficient with how you work. And don't hold heated instruments in the root canal system for a very, very long time. It's not a smart thing to do. Carrier systems, this is your thick plastic thermophil. Um, thermophil is now kind of transformed into gutter core. Um, or gut fusion where the carrier in the middle originally used to be like a plastic or metal based material, but now they've moved to like a cross sectional um, GP kind of design. Um, it's advantages of carrier based systems such as thermophil is it's quick, simple, and effective obturation system. Okay. Um, and it's standardized to your preparation. So your thermophil points are the same as what you prepared the canal with. Difficulties come when it comes to retreatment, okay, as it proves to be more challenging, okay, to remove a thermophil point. You can remove them under a microscope very easy, okay, or I wouldn't say very easy, but relatively easy. Um, but you've just got to be able to see it, okay, 
downsides of thermothor, expense, you've got to buy equipment again. Curved canals are always going to be a little bit more challenging. Wider taper carriers, so how wide does your preparation have to be? And we talked that on the last webinar, a webinar of the importance of preserving as much peri-cervical dentine as we possibly can. So we don't want those large, large tapers that we used to have historically. It can be readily abused because it's it's quick and efficient. When anything is advertised as quick and efficient, we're dentists try and make it even more efficient by taking even more shortcuts, but try not to. And then the other downside effects is it's heated in an oven, which may cause some weakness within the GP and it's a plunger effect. So how do you know when you're inserting that carrier that the GP is not slid off on one side and is just being pushed up on the other? There's too many variabilities for me to be feel to feel comfortable using Thermophil. But if someone's been using it for donkey's years and they're great at using it, I wouldn't say change. If you become comfortable with the system and you feel confident using it, then keep on going. But always try and elevate your processes. If something new comes out there, say or ask yourself, is this going to improve my current method or technique? Or if we're outcome driven, which all of us should be, is is this likely to influence my success rates? And if it is, is it worth investing in and enhancing or upgrading my current technique? If you guys haven't seen Thermophil, like I said, the slides, plastic or titanium carriers that were coated with alpha phase GP, they heat it up in the oven um, and then placed within the root canal system. Before you heat up, you do get verification carriers where you can take a check x-ray with verifiers within the canals. Retreatment, like, men, like I mentioned, can be an absolute pain, um, but fundamentally now they've created like a notch, which you can try and look for and insert a hand instrument, normally a headstrong file within that space to try and lift out the carrier. The chloroform dip technique or diffusion technique, this is what I showed you or explained to you earlier. You can modify the tip of a master cone by dipping it in chloroform and then allowing it to take the shape of the apical and the existing apical anatomy of the canal. But now, obturation techniques using solvents have been abandoned and replaced with materials and methods that exhibit minimum shrinkage. We don't do this, and plus, we're not meant to be using chloroform anymore because it's been formed, found to be carcinogenic or cytotoxic. But that's what it looks like. Again, historically, better apical seal. It's pretty obvious why a better apical seal is well as a better adapted GP cone. Not going to talk you through the technique. Have I done this? In practice, yes. In real life, I don't do this. To round everything off, okay, evaluation. Which method is best and why, okay? Loads have tried to convert, compare, but systematic reviews and meta-analysis have all fundamentally shown, okay, um, that outcomes were fairly similar, okay? Um, the conclusions demonstrate that although overextension was more likely to occur with warm vertical than with cold lateral, post to pain, obturation quality, and long-term outcomes were similar between the two groups. So I would say just get comfortable with what you're doing, okay? But for me, if I can more predictably clean and shape the root canal system and obturate it as fully as I can achieve, I feel more comfortable. I know we're meant to be talking about obturation today, and it doesn't seem like I'm shutting up about um, disinfection and instrumentation is more crucial to the final outcome. Remember, it's always more important what you take out rather than what you put in within the root canal system, okay? And remember, the outcome's always dependent on a multitude of factors, okay? And no method of obturation at present can boast a superior clinical outcome or can document that. So just get comfortable with what you're used to or learn the numerous techniques and use the one that you feel more comfortable with. Studies that are often quoted in relation to obturation, okay. Clevin and Egging is a famous paper that 
demonstrated that the canal was instrumented and disinfected, but did not be, was not obturated. Um, but healing was achieved. Okay, so they didn't they cleaned the obturated and then left didn't do any obturation, sealed the coronal aspect of the tooth off, took post-op X-rays later, or after a year's healing time period, and found that healing had occurred. Okay. But remember, root fillings are needed since the root canal space with time can become reinfected by leakage through any restorative material that you use. The coronal restoration is obviously an essential barrier to avoid penetration of fluid and microorganisms in the root canal and consequently into the periapical tissues. Okay. Um, Saunders and Saunders in 1994 said the canal orifices and the pulp chamber floor should be covered with a lining of IRM or GIC after removing excessive gutta perca and sealer. Fundamentally, you have to just seal off the canal orifices. I normally do a sub seal. And what that, what that means is I'll obturate and make sure my obturation is most probably terminates a millimeter or two beneath orifice level. Um, and for me, as I'm an outcome driven clinician, I don't like to introduce multiple layers into my final restoration. And I believe in biomimetic dentistry and creating a tight seal through knowing what bond strengths you're achieving to your dentine. Um, so I use composite or fiber reinforced composite like Everex posterior, or I use ribbons to get my strength or decreases the, the chances of fracture on my restoration to enhancing my resto element. Um, also, no studies have shown better outcomes when using IRM or GICs. And we know that no study when looking at factors that influence the outcome of root canal treatment have said that if you don't do an orifice seal with IRM or GIC that you're going to get a higher success rate by doing that. I'd rather replace with a material that has similar properties to dentine than something that is like anti, more antibacterial. Why? Because your root canals should be the cleanest at the time of obturation. So I want to then think of longevity once I've got everything clean and longevity and strength will come by replacing the tooth with more tooth-like materials, okay? Classic paper, finally, Ray and Trope, okay? Um, the quality of the root canal or the quality of the coronal restoration is a more important factor for outcome than the quality of endodontic treatment. Everyone quotes this especially in case presentations, when they've done a poor endo, they'll say, well, the endo is poor. It doesn't matter. It's the quality of the coronal seal that matters. No, we want to get the endo as good as we possibly can and then restore it immediately afterwards to get a predictable seal and a better long-term outcome by reducing the tooth possibility of fracture, okay? I'm grateful for your time and I thank you for listening. The only thing I would add when it comes to restoration, I did do this presentation and if I did restoration of the root filled tooth fully, I'd have you here till 10 o'clock tonight. Um, so we've covered obturation in detail, but when it comes to coronal seal or restoration of the root filled tooth, for me, I'm a biomimetic dentist, so I would love everyone to follow the journey of preserving as much tooth tissue as possible and restoring the tooth with as tooth-like materials as possible. For, so for me, it's composite cores with horizontal layering techniques, okay, and keeping C-factor stresses to a minimal. For others, I've got nothing against those that use amalgam cores. GIC cores, I don't think is a smart idea, okay, because it just doesn't have that strength unless it's little repairs, and I still wouldn't do it because it doesn't take that long to do a composite, especially once you've got rubber dam on, um, and you'd be more predictable. But the idea is seal the root canal system off with a core cool buildup material immediately after your obturation, and fundamentally your posterior teeth will need cuspal coverage after RCT. Your anterior teeth, due to the differing types of loads, 
that place on the teeth may not necessarily need that. Um, thank you for listening. Okay. And obviously, if any of you are ever interested in learning what I'm more passionate about, then I'd love for you guys to follow us at Dr. Didge underscore Evo Endo. And then our courses are on evoendo.co.uk. But I thank you for your time. And if you guys have any questions, I'll answer them now.